Welcome back to Lab Rise Scientific. Now this is part two of a two-part series on how to build your own hydroelectric power generator. Now in part one, I talked about the mechanical electrical design of the system. Now in this video, I want to talk about how to build a water wheel and test it to make sure it can work. Now let's get started by taking a look at the construction of the water wheel. The water wheel under construction. Now it's one meter in diameter, so I've got two plywood discs that serves the side of the water wheel. And these wood planks create the compartments that will hold the water. The water will come in, fill the compartments, and that will create the moment needed to spin the water wheel. Now I have all my hardware attached to my water wheel. I've transferred a bicycle wheel with the spokes cut out of it onto my water wheel. And that drives the belt, which drives the alternator. I've got my bridge rectifier and my dc to -DC converter and a watt meter for looking at the power output and also my digital voltmeter. So as I spin the water wheel, you can see it generates electricity. And the question is, can I get this wheel to spin fast enough with the current configuration to generate electricity using running water? Now my biggest concern at this point is whether I can get my water wheel to spin fast enough to turn the alternator fast enough to generate the 12.1 volts I need. So I'll have to do some additional experimentation to figure that out. This test will see if the pure gravitational torque the torque that's generated by just the weight of the water in each of the five wet cells is sufficient to give the 0.42 revolutions per second spin rate of the water wheel to generate the necessarily 12 volts. What we have is the uh, five wet cells contain a bag of water, each of which contains the proper amount of water for each cell. I'll simply let it go and we'll see what kind of spin rate we get. Now here are the results of the gravitational torque rotation tests. Now this data is obtained by looking at the wheel moving one half revolution and one revolution and counting the number of video frames required. It took 1.3 seconds for the wheel to rotate one half revolution. This gives a rotational rate of 0.3 revolutions per second. Now it took 2.4 seconds for the wheel to rotate one revolution. This gives a 0.42 revolutions per second rotation rate. In conclusion, the required rotation rate of 0.42 revolutions per second can be achieved solely by the gravitational torque. Now note, this is a conservative test since in reality additional compartments will fill with water as the wheel rotates, maintaining the torque level. The next question is, how much water does it take to get the water wheel to spin at the necessary velocity? Well, we can approximate the amount of flow rate we need as follows. If we assume the water wheel is spinning at 0.42 revolutions per second as required to get to 12 volts DC, the time each compartment of the 15 compartment water wheel will be exposed to the water flow is estimated as follows. Here's our 0.42 revolutions per second. We multiply that by 15 compartments per revolution. This gives 6.3 compartments per second. Now the water supply exposure time is one compartment divided by 6.31 compartments per second given an exposure time of 0.16 seconds. So each compartment will only be exposed to the water flow for 0.16 seconds. So the required flow rate is the amount of water in the compartments, which is 2.3 liters, divided by 0.16 seconds gives 14.4 liters per second. That's how much water must be flowing in order to fill up the compartments to rotate the wheel at 0.42 revolutions per second. Now I need to devise some sort of test to see if the approximated flow rate is actually sufficient to drive the water wheel. Now, unfortunately, I don't have access to a freely flowing stream to give me water to test my wheel, so I'm gonna to have to devise some sort of test. Now what I'm gonna to intend to do is use a four inch diameter or 10 centimeter diameter PVC pipe to make a flume to provide some water flow that I can control. Here's the water flume concept. I'm going to have a 4 inch diameter PVC pipe, or 10 centimeters in diameter. I'm going to fill it with water to a length of 2.5 meters. Now, to remove the plug from the pipe, the water will flow in the wheel, causing it to spin. I'm going to be able to set the angle of this flume to various angles to give me the proper flow rate that I need to get the wheel to spin to the proper rotational velocity. Now, here's a picture of the flume, simple PVC pipe. I've cut a hole here at the top to allow me to fill it with a bucket of water. I have a plug here at the end so I can release the water when I want it to come out. And again, I'll set the proper angle here to give me the desired flow rate of 14.4 liters per second. 
Now let's visualize what's going on inside the PVC pipe. Here's my pipe filled with water. Now I can think of the water as individual packets represented by these rectangles, the green packet being the highest level of the water in the tube. Now, when we pull the plug, gravity will start pulling each of these slugs down the tube and accelerate them faster and faster as they move. So I can calculate the tube drain time by calculating how much time it takes for that last green packet to move from the top of the tube down to the bottom of the tube. So in reality, the inclined tube is exactly like an inclined plane. So you can apply some inclined plane theory. So here's our green slug of water sitting on an inclined plane, and gravity is acting downwards at 9.8 meters per second squared. What we want is the acceleration along the pipe or along the plane. So you apply some trigonometry, we get the acceleration perpendicular to the plane, and the acceleration parallel to the plane. So acceleration is equal to g times sine theta. Now applying some basic calculus, we know that velocity is equal to acceleration times time, and the distance that slug moves is equal to one half times acceleration times time squared. So for a five degree incline, acceleration is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared times sine of five degrees, which is equal to 0 0.85 meters per second squared. Now by applying some algebra to the distance equation, we can calculate how long it takes that slug to move down the incline. That's time is equal to the square root of two times the distance moved divided by the acceleration. If we look at some images of the water exiting the tube, we can see evidence that the water is actually accelerating over time. The top picture at time one shows the water shooting out a certain distance. The second picture, time two, shows it shooting out a little bit further. And at time three, we see the water shooting out pretty far relative to time one. This is evidence that the water is flowing faster and thus moving out further as it leaves the tube. Before I invest in some expensive PVC pipe and some fittings, I want to understand the behavior of water as it moves through the flume, and maybe be able to come up with some way to predict the flow rate. Now, what I've done is I've got a small plastic tube, and I can do some experiments in the laboratory to understand how the water behaves in the flume. Here's my test apparatus. It's a simple clear plastic tube I got from my hardware store. It's filled with colored water, so I can actually see the flow as it moves down the tube. I simply pull out a plug at the bottom, and watch how the water behaves. My plug is just a simple practice golf ball. It's like a miniature wiffle ball. It's sealed in a tube with a plastic bag. This so happens to fit the inside diameter of my tube. And here we go, you just pull the string to release the plug. Here are the configurations I'll be testing. I'll incline the pipe at 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees, and 90 degrees. And for each test, the water column length in the pipe will be 0 0.8 meters. And the water volume contained within the pipe is 1.0 liters in each case. Just test at 10 degrees. Just test at 20 degrees. This test is 30 degrees. Here's the tabulated test results. For an incline of 10 degrees, it took 30 frames of video for the pipe to drain and the video was at 30 frames per second. So that means the drain time was 1.0 seconds, and that gives an average flow rate of 1.0 liters per second. Now the 20 degree incline had a flow rate of 1.4 liters per second, the 30 degree incline had 1.8 liters per second, and the 90 degree vertical incline gave 3.0 liters per second. Now here's that data plotted on a graph, and the red dots represent approximated values points I did not test for 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80 degrees. Now, does this data make sense? Well, first, let's look at a 10 degree incline. Here's the incline plane calculations. If I calculate the theoretical descent time, I get 0 0.97 seconds, and the actual water drain time was 1.0 seconds. Now, for a vertical 90 degree incline, here's the acceleration, velocity, and distance equations. I get a theoretical descent time of 0 0.4 seconds, an actual water drain time of 0.4 seconds. So in conclusion, the water does indeed move in exactly the same way as a frictionless mass descending along an inclined plane. Now let's apply this theory to the full-scale PVC flume. Here's a system we'll be analyzing. Once again, we have a four inch diameter or 10 centimeter diameter PVC pipe. And the length of the water inside the pipe is approximately 2.5 meters. 
and we'll incline our pipe by five degrees. So here's our acceleration equation for the acceleration along the pipe. This acceleration is equal to g times sine theta. That comes out to be 0 0.85 meters per second squared. We're going to need to know the cross-sectional area of the PVC pipe. The area is pi r squared. That comes out to be 0 0.0079 meters squared. We also want to know the volume inside the pipe. So volume is the area times the length of water. And so that comes out to be 0 0.02 meters cubed, which is 20 liters. Now I can predict the drain time of the pipe by taking the distance equation, where distance is equal to 1 half times acceleration times time squared. Perform a little bit of algebra, and we can do the calculation and see that the drain time is 2.4 seconds. And that's the theoretical drain time for the system. I can incorporate the inclined plane equations to create a spreadsheet to help me perform the analysis. Now here's my spreadsheet. You see I have a tube diameter of 10 centimeters. I've got a water column length of 2.5 meters. I've got a tube incline of five degrees. Now the spreadsheet calculates the acceleration along the tube and that's 0 0.85 meters per second squared. That's the same value I calculated earlier. The spreadsheet also calculates the drain time of 2.42 seconds. Again, the value I calculated earlier. Now the beauty of the spreadsheet is I can calculate the flow velocities and flow rates as a function of time between zero and 2.4 seconds, which is the drain time of the tube. I can easily go in here and change these parameters and look at all kinds of different configurations. Here's the flow velocity in meters per second plotted against time. You see, because acceleration due to gravity is constant, I get a nice straight line between when I pull the plug at zero flow velocity up to about 2.0 meters per second when the tube finally drains. Now I can get the volumetric flow rate by multiplying the flow velocity times the cross-sectional area of the tube. What I get is liters per second. Now it starts off at, of course, zero, and then moves up to about 16 liters per second when the tube is finally drained. Now the total volume of water that moves through the tube can be determined by calculating the area under the flow curve. So here I have my flow curve, it makes a nice triangle, and this area represents the total volume moving through the pipe. So volume is one half base time height, which is the area of a triangle, and that comes out to be 19.3 liters. Now this theoretical value of 19.3 liters is close to the volume of the water, 20 liters, which is actually placed in the flume for the test. This indicates that the approximating approach is sound and thus can be used to establish test parameters. Now we need to take a look at the actual full-scale flume to see how the water behaves to understand whether or not we need to adjust our theoretical approach to calculating the water flow rate. First we'll take a look at the flume and then run a quick test. Here's the final water wheel configuration. This is the water wheel, the drive belt, the alternator, and the support electronics. Then here's the flume that will provide the water to run the wheel for the test. It's inclined at 5 degrees and holds about 20 liters of water. Now some interesting observations can be made from that flume demonstration. First of all, the actual drain time, approximately 2.6 seconds, was pretty close to the theoretical drain time of 2.4 seconds. It's certainly close enough for our purposes. Now the flow rate is not linear as theory predicts. The flow rate coming out of the tube initially is low, then builds to a maximum, then tapers off once again just before the tube is fully drained. You can see that in the photographs to the left. Now, these two observations can be used to approximate a more accurate representation of the actual flow rate during the test. So the approximated actual flow rate, the gold curve, can be established by applying some engineering judgment. First of all, the drain time is accurate. And the areas under the curves, the total volumes, need to be the same. So the area under the gold parabola needs to be the same as the area under the blue straight line. The flow curve is symmetrical relative to the time with a maximum flow halfway through the draining process. So what I did was manually create the gold parabola, trying to match the area under the curve, so I got a consistent flow rate between the two. Now this results in an approximated maximum flow rate of 14 liters per second. So it's a little bit less than the theoretical flow rate. So the estimated flow rate required by earlier experimentation requires 14.4 liters per second. Now the maximum flow rate from the flume test 
comes up with approximately 14 liters per second. So in conclusion, the flume, when inclined at 5 degrees with a water volume of 20 liters, it appears to be able to provide the flow rate for a short period of time, approximately half a second, is equivalent to the required flow rate to get the system to spin at the proper speed. Now let's get into the testing of the full-scale water wheel. Now the first thing we need to do is fill the flume with 20 liters of water. Now let's run our full-scale flume test to see if we can get the 0.42 revolutions per second spin rate necessary to generate the 12.1 volts DC. We are first water test to test the water wheel to see if it can produce the 12.1 volts I desire. And here's the final result of our full-scale water wheel test. Now we calculated the rotation rate of the water wheel by counting video frames once again. And the wheel achieved a rotation rate of approximately 0.5 revolutions per second. And this is greater than the 0.42 revolutions per second that's required to generate the necessary voltage. So that's certainly good. And you can see from the voltmeter in the picture, we achieved 12.1 volts DC. So in conclusion, the system functions as designed. The water wheel achieved a velocity that was higher than expected. So what was the cause? Well, first of all, there's flow momentum. Recall earlier experiments that demonstrated that the gravitational torque is sufficient to spin the wheel at the required speed, or at least just barely. However, there's another force that comes into play. This force is caused by the velocity and mass of the water, or the momentum of the water, imparting momentum to the water wheel vanes. This is a lot like taking a hose and squirting a basketball. The stream of water will push the basketball across the ground. This additional force provides margin that ensures the wheel will spin as desired. And this force was not accounted for in the analysis. Newton's laws of motion also come into play. As the gravity and momentum forces are applied over time, the wheel's rotational velocity will increase. This comes from F equals MA. Now this will continue until the forces become balanced and a constant velocity is achieved. This is why the wheel achieved a higher rotational rate than our analysis predicted. Well, that wraps it up. And this is a pretty complex project. However, I did manage to build a system that should actually work and generate the 12 volts I need. Now, I must admit this is the first time I've ever tried this, and so the system I have developed is pretty inefficient, and it's got some problems. For example, it's gonna be kind of hard to find a stream that has a one meter water drop to run this particular wheel. However, I've got some insights and I developed some tools that will help me design a more efficient system in the future. And maybe I'll even give a shot to building a more compact water turbine. Well, that's it for now. I hope to see you next time at Lab Rat Scientific.